Well, Cedar Street Baptist Church, I love you so very much. It's my joy to be with you here this morning. Good to have you guys in the house as well. Thank you, Brother Rick, for stirring our hearts and reminding us of the power of God's Word. I pray that the Lord will help me to be faithful to just proclaim His truth this morning and that it won't return void. If you are here for the first time or it's been a little while since you've been here, uh, we are in the midst of a series out of Psalm 139. The title of our series is Searching Our Sacred God. Searching Our Sacred God as we search the unsearchable riches of our Creator and find out just how much He is searching each one of us. Uh, I love this psalm. It's meant a lot to me over the years, and I wanted to really just take every single verse and, and ponder what it is that God is teaching us that we can know about Him and what He wants us to know about ourselves and His presence. And so that we're in the third week of the series, as we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18 this morning. The title of our message here this morning is Searching God's Sacred Work. Searching God's Sacred Work. So far in the series, we've, we've talked about searching His knowledge, that not only does God know everything, but that God knows everything about you. He knows every single thing about you, and that ought to sober us, but it also should encourage us that he knows every ache, every pain. He keeps our tears in a bottle. They are also in his book. And then we also talked about last week uh, when we search God's sacred presence that he's everywhere at all times. But yet, even though he's everywhere at all times as a reigning king, and even though he will be present for non-believers as a judge... For us that are followers in Jesus Christ, we can know his relational presence as a father. Amen. That he can draw, we can draw close to him because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Today, as we, again, we turn our attention to verses 13 through 18, we're going to be looking at the work of God, but specifically, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a human being. What does it mean to be human? As I had one professor say, what is the stuff of man? When God created us, why did he create us? How did he create us? And our understanding of how he created us, how should that change the way that we approach him? You see, for those of you that even remember this in your, in your elementary school days of Sunday school, we know that God created the earth in six days, and at the end of the sixth day, the crown jewel of his creation was human beings, right? Everything that he created each day, he'd stop and look back and reflect and say, this is good, this is good. But at the end of the sixth day when he made human beings, he said, this is very good. He was making a statement. He was saying that we as human beings are the crown jewel of his creation. And God is amazing in the way that he has created us as human beings. You know, with the thousands and thousands of years that human beings have been able to, to observe the human body, there's still so many mysteries that even the smartest doctors cannot answer. There's so many facts I could tell you about the human body. I'll, I'll tell you just a few that just point to God as an artist. Uh, doctors say that fetuses have unique fingerprints at just three months. Each one of us not only has fingerprints, we each have a unique tongue print. Uh, noses can remember 50,000 different scents. Skin sheds 600,000 particles every hour. So congratulations to the one sitting next to you before you leave today is going to leave over half a million little particles of skin right near you. <laughs> but you're going to do the same to them. Doctors say that hearts can beat up to 100,000 times per day. And this last one, it sounds absurd, but I went to multiple sources to confirm it. If you were to take every single tiny blood vessel that you have and connect it and stretch it out, each human body has enough blood vessels that would cover 100,000 miles. One person. That sounds absurd. I, I had to check multiple sources to confirm that. And that's just one human being. And so I, I think you and I can say that God took his time. God gave intention and beauty and purpose in every single solitary human being that he has ever created. And God is not a God who makes mistakes. And so I want us to be thinking, and I want you to be thinking, about how it is that God has created you. And throughout this message, my hope is, as has been the case in the previous two parts that we've looked at in Psalm 139, is that the more that you can understand God's intention in creating you, the more that you can surrender your life to Him. 
that you're not an accident. I don't care where you come from, what your background is. That you've got a divine purpose in your life. I don't care how bad you've messed it up. That today is a day that you can recognize God's design of your life, his hand on your life, and your opportunity to resurrender your life to him through Christ. So what's our big ideas? Again, we walk through Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. In one sentence, when we search God's sacred work, we learn to surrender to an intentional creator who fearfully and wonderfully made us. When we search God's sacred work, we learn to surrender to an intentional creator who fearfully and wonderfully made us. So if you want to know more about the sacred work of God that we can search together, would you join me by turning to the book of, Psal- uh, book of Psalms, Psalm 139. I always say if you open your Bible right in the middle, you're going to land on a psalm somewhere. So open your Bible to the middle. Again, this is going to be after Job before Proverbs. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab the Pew Bible in front of you or beside you. We're on page 16, 618 in your Pew Bible. And if you're able and willing, would you stand at this time? Out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and fully sufficient word. We're in Psalm 139. Again, we're going to start in verse 13 and work our way through verse 18. Hear God's word to us through his servant, David, inspired of the Holy Spirit of God. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, so many situations taking place in this church right now. So many things beyond our control. So many opportunities for anxiety and worry. And yet at the same time, Lord, if you are the type of God who gave us 100,000 miles worth of blood vessels in each and every single one of us, perhaps you know exactly what needs to happen in the next 24 hours of our life. Lord, you, you call us to surrender to control to you, and then we try to take that control back every single day. My prayer would be in our time together here this morning that your, your word would not return void, but it would lead in us a greater love and appreciation for your hand of creation, how you've you've intricately woven each of us in our mother's womb. Doesn't matter where we're from, doesn't matter what our background is. You have a purpose for our life. You've placed your image on us. And Lord, I pray each of us would leave here today more surrendered to you who is fully in control of all things. You are good. You do good. You work all things together for good, for those that love you. Maybe we may all of us be counted among those here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, amen. Amen. So I've been saying throughout the series, if you look at Psalm 139, it's a beautiful psalm. I pray for the rest of your life, all the time that we've spent this month on that psalm, that you'll, you'll think about it when you're passing it in the scriptures. If there's one word that would describe... This psalm, it's a psalm of knowing. Again, God wants you to know his sacred knowledge, that he knows all things, including everything about you. He wants you to know his presence. He wants you to taste and experience a sweet love relationship with him. And as, again, we look at verses 13 through 18 today, he wants you to know the intention that he had when he started making you in the womb of your mother. And the more that we know, the more that we need to to surrender to this understanding of just how uniquely he's created each of us. And as we look at this, here's what I want to say about human beings. What's the stuff of man? What makes a human being? Well, we're going to be talking about the body and the soul and all the things that God has done. But let me just say very clearly 
there's, there's always a tension in the scripture that you have to recognize. A couple of weeks ago, I said the tension is that God is huge and he's beyond understanding, but yet he's close and we can have relationship. That was the last two weeks. Today, here's the tension that I want you to hold on to. Don't try to resolve it. Rest in it. Every human being is two things at one time. On the one hand, you and I are nothing but dust. We're the dust of the earth. That's how God created Adam and every human being that came from Adam and Eve. We are the dust of the earth, and that should humble us. On the other hand, we are made in the image of the creator, and we've been given divine purpose and value. So on the one hand, we're dirt. On the other hand, we're the most precious thing on planet earth. You say, Bo, that sounds like a contradiction. It's not. When we remember that we are dirt, and any accomplishment that we have in life we know comes from God. Because if he left us to ourselves, we'd still be dirt. At the same time, we need to recognize that we are valuable. Every human being made in the image of God is worthy of love and respect. Because God placed his image on them. Now, we should have a general love and, and appreciation for all of creation, but God didn't do that for the birds. God didn't do that for the fish. You know, a lot of us in this room have pets that we love. I'm a dog lover. I love dogs. I love big dogs. Well, it, it doesn't matter how much we love dogs. They're not human beings. God did not place his image on them. We have dominion over them. And so we should love them, but we should never treat them as human beings, and we should never treat human beings as dogs either. Right? We get it backwards sometimes. We give our dogs a better seat at the table than we give other people. We should never get it twisted. All right? When it comes to the scriptures, the human beings are made in the image of God. We we're come from the dust of the earth, but we have this image that God has given us. And I love Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. I'm just going to read it real quickly. Because you can see both of these things happening at the same time. The dust and the image. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Get this. He decided to create Adam out of the raw materials of the earth. Now, how did God create the earth? He spoke it. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God spoke, and God spoke, and God spoke. So God can create simply by speaking. Yet he made a decision when he, when he created human beings. Not only did he go beyond speaking, it says in, in Genesis 2-7, we can get this image that God knelt all the way down and personally breathed life into the nostrils of Adam. I read one translation that said that he kissed Adam. Now, it doesn't say that in the text, but you can imply there's an intimacy of breathing life into the nostrils of this dust. And he became a living being. So God cares deeply for all of creation, but specifically for human beings that are made in his image. And with this comes a lot of blessings and also responsibilities, and we're going to be looking at that together. But I want to look at three key aspects of human beings as God's sacred work that should lead us to a deeper surrender of him. So let's look at this together. As we start at verses 13 through 14, let's look at the formation of God's sacred work. How does God make a human being? Well, we know how he made the first human being. Adam, he took him from dust. And we know how he made the second human being. He took Eve out of the rib of Adam. And then every human being since then has been through the procreation of man and woman. But listen to what it says once that, that, that uh, embryo is in the womb of a woman. Here's what it says in verses 13 through 14. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Life happens at conception, period, period. I don't mean that just as a political statement. I mean it as a biblical statement. Life happens at conception because from the very moment, all right, that a sperm and an egg meet inside the womb of a woman, God has a decision. God has a purpose. God is at work in that life. And it says that he's working together, forming the inward parts. He is forming a body, 
and a soul. We need to understand this about human beings, okay? We are fully physical and we are fully spiritual. And one of the great tr uh, struggles of the Christian life is when you get saved, the inward starts getting renewed as the outward is wasting away. That's the, that's the Christian life. The good news is that one day the outward will be brand new just like the inward. But from the very beginning, God's at work because God created us to be physical and spiritual human beings. And he says in verse 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, the way that I like to explain this is that we are united yet unique. Now, what does it mean that we're fearfully made? Well, we are made with the reverence and awe of God in his image. We're made in his image, meaning, again, we have divine purpose and value. What it means to be made in his image is we have an ability to have relationship, rational thought, and interaction with him that animals cannot have. God's placed that value on us. But also, it's fearful in that you and I come from Adam and Eve, so not only are we made in a divine image, but we also have a fallen, sinful nature. you got to get this. Please hear me. A lot, of, And this is the limitation of humanistic psychology. Now, I have no problem with psychology. I believe all truth is God's truth. And so anytime I'm trying to help people with counseling, I'll read scripture. I'll read biblical counseling books. I'll read secular counseling books because I want to help people. But here's the limitation. If you're someone who's struggling right now and you're going to a counselor that doesn't know the Bible, let me just say this. Psychology will always say we got to get back to the root issue and heal it for you to grow. And so we're always going back to our childhood, right? We're always going back to those times that our parents said and did things and, and we had issues at school and all of a sudden, you know, that's when I became who I am today. I got to go back and heal that. You know, here's what the Bible would teach. No, when you were in your mother's womb, you had a divine image given to you by God, but you have a sinful nature that you inherited from your ancestors. You and I were born in beauty, but we were also born broken. And so the only way to heal that is not to go back to your childhood. The only way to heal that is to go to Jesus. Because Jesus is changing our nature from the inside out. That's exactly what he's doing. When Jesus said, I'm building a different kingdom, he's not talking about the outward kingdom where he was going to slay the Romans and take a, a political throne. No, he said, I'm changing human hearts. I'm changing natures. If you're in this room right now and you're struggling, I just want to say what you need is more of Christ. There are things on this side of heaven that may never be healed, but one thing God can do is heal your soul. He can make you right with God. He can make you right with the Lord. And that, so we're fearfully made, but we're also wonderfully made. Here's the other side of this. As God is creating you in the womb of your mother, he's not going to create a single person like you ever again. Even if you are in this room and you are an identical twin, you are alike in so many different ways, but there's always something different about you from your twin. Every single person in this room is a masterpiece. Now, again, we're born with deficiencies. We're born in brokenness. Some of you in this room may be born with disabilities or you have children born with disabilities. That's part of the fallen nature. But at the same time, you get this. God didn't make a mistake on your child. He didn't make a mistake on you. He knew exactly what he was doing. He chose the exact family and situation that you or your children are in because he's at work. He makes no mistakes. And so can I just say before we go on to point two, as we think about the formation of God's sacred work, can you just rest can you rest for a minute that the person that you are and maybe the children, the grandchildren that you have and all the things that you wish were different, what you have today is what God chose for you and he did not make a mistake. Trust him. Now, if all we had was this world, right? If all we had was this world, then that wouldn't exactly be great news. But the promise is beyond this world, in the new heavens and new earth, for all that have placed their faith in the Lord, we will finally be able to look at each other in perfection. Some of you that have disabilities, you will be able in the new heavens and new earth to live a life completely free of that. For those of you that have children or grandchildren with disabilities, you'll be able to walk with them for all of eternity, and all of that will be cast away, and they will be in perfection. But until then, rest. 
that if he went to all the trouble to knit you together in your mother's womb, and he's God, he didn't make mistakes. So that's number one, the formation of God's sacred work. Number two, let's look at the intention as we go a little bit deeper. The intention of God's sacred work. Verses 15 through 16. It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Again, as you look at verse 15, It says that we're made in secret, that we're intricately woven, that there's things that are happening. When a woman is pregnant, there's things that are happening where God is at work and no one can see it or know it but God. It's not going to show up in an ultrasound. God is at work and he's knitting us together and he's, he's intricately weaving together all these parts and all these things that he's doing. And so there's a mysterious and intentional involvement of God in every single human being. And then in verse 16, Basically, he says that your eyes, Lord, your eyes see things that nobody else sees. And the two things he talks about, he says, your eyes see my body before it was formed. And get this, he says, your eyes see my days before they're lived. Can, can you stop just for a moment and say, if you are in a situation right now and you think that your issues are just a, a core of some random sequence of events, God knew your body before he made it and he knew your life before you lived a single day of it. You know, I have a friend of mine in Swainsboro, uh, our dear friend, John Terwilliger. He's one of my adopted fathers. And I go have lunch with him all the time. And I tell him, I say, Papa John, I'll be here 90 years if God wants me to, but I just want to be in heaven. I want to be with him. I yearn for him. Some days it's overwhelming. And he always says the same thing. He smiles at me and says, young brother, I believe God's got that day on his calendar already. He does. He does. Before you were ever born, he chose the days that you'd walk the face of this earth. What he wants is each and every one of those days, if he's already chosen them for you, is that you would walk faithfully with him in each of those days. You and I can trust him. He's got a design and he's got a purpose for each of the things that he's done in our lives. He's got a design. If he knit you together, guess what he did? He gave you gifts. And can I also say this? Because he's a good father, he didn't give you every gift. Who in this room who's a parent would give their child every single gift they asked for? You know what? You'd get a spoiled child. So what did God do in each of us? He has given us unique gifts so that we can serve him. But he's also given us deficiencies so that we know that we need him. And how many of us in this room spend more of our time envying the things that we don't have instead of cultivating the things that we do? I was talking to our deacons during a retreat this weekend that I have always envied high productive leaders. I told John Jordan I would trade with him in a second the ability to get up at 4 a.m. and start putting agendas together. I don't have that gift. I tried to will that uh, years ago when Jim Savage and I were accountability partners. I tried for 30 straight days to get up at 5 a.m. and check in with him, and I was just as tired in day 30 as I was in day one. God did not make me a morning person, and sheer will is never going to change that. My buddy Steve, who is with us, pastors a 500-member church in Atlanta. He's where he should be, and I'm where I should be, because he spends about 10 minutes with 15 people, and I spend about two hours with two people. That's what my day looks like, because that's how God made me. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that God is helping me, but I'm st- I still have a long way to go. There's ways that God has made me, and there's ways that he hasn't. And the same with you. I, I'm just telling you, we spend so much time on social media, and in public, admiring other people, yearning to be where they are, yearning to have what they have, yearning to do things exactly the way that they do them. And by doing that, we completely ignore that God made us as a masterpiece. He's got a, and let me just say this, if you don't know what your gifts are, you need to ask other people, because when he made you, he didn't forget to give you gifts. And if you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you've been given a whole new set of spiritual gifts. I got saved at 27. No one ever told me prior to 27 years old that I had a gift of teaching. After 27, it's a topic that came up a lot until I realized it was a calling that God put on my life. Some of you don't even know the best gifts that God has given you. You haven't even experienced them yet. 
But can you trust him with what you already understand, that you have a design and you also have a purpose? Every person in this room has a mission. All right? And, and the, the, the world and the kingdom are not going to be what God intended for it to be until you fulfill the mission that God has called you. And I've been saying this for months. I'll say it again. Don't lose sleep trying to figure out what the mission is. Pay attention today on what God is doing and take one step beyond your level of comfort to meet him there. You do that every day, you will fulfill the mission that God has called you to. This is the God who intentionally made each of us. Can we rest in that today? All right, that's the formation of God's sacred work. That's the intention of God's sacred work. Third and finally, as we look at verses 17 through 18, I love this. Let's look at the reflection of God's sacred work. It says in verses 17 through 18, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Now, here's what I love about this. David's not just saying, oh, man, you got such a, such a sharp mind, God. Your thoughts are so infinite, I could never know what they are. No, look at the context. David is saying, I can't get over how intentional your thoughts are about me and every human being that you've made. You know, if you look at the scriptures in the book of Genesis, again, go back to the creation account in Genesis 1. What you'll see is every time God got done in one day of creation, it said he would look at all that he had made and behold, it was good. You know, we do that too. You get done mowing the grass. What do you do before you put the mower up? You admire. Man, those lines are straight or ooh, I could have made them straighter. When you get done, there's something deeply satisfying when you get done something that you intended to do to step back and look at the finished product and say, that was worth it. David's saying, how precious are your thoughts that when you look at human beings, you reflect on the joy of making them. I mean, that's what it said in Genesis 1.31. Again, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. He looked back at all of creation, and he was saying, this is good, this is good, this is good. But then he looked at Adam, and he said, oh, this is very good. This is very good. And if he intricately weaves each of us together in our mother's womb, his thoughts for you are the same way. It's good that I made her. It's good that I made him. I see a little of my image in this person. I want to have a love relationship with this person. I want them to share my, my, my son with other people. I want to build the kingdom through this person. This is good. This is good. This is very good. And in verse 18, he says, I am awake and I am still with you. One of the ways we can translate that, David is saying, all this time you've been thinking about me. Now I have a consciousness I can think about you. Would you even for one day be able to think about God as much as he thinks about you? We'll never get there, but we can get closer. You know, I got a lot of growing to do like everybody in this room. I was reminded this morning as I was getting ready that my prayer life is just not uh, what I believe God wants for me. That I'm just not as uh, just all in fervent hours of the day the way that I want to be. So I'm growing like everybody else. But let me just say, when I first got saved at 27... One of the things I noticed within the first couple of years of my walk with the Lord and even today is I can tell you honestly, and it's the Holy Spirit, it's not me, that I am thinking about God most of my day. Sometimes probably too much. I mean, sometimes I need, uh, I need to get out of my head and get, get some things finished. Uh, but Part of the mark of a Christian life when you're walking with God is you ought to be able to look at your life and say, you know, God is in my mind a lot more than he used to be. I, I got this ongoing relationship with my creator and I'm thinking about him. You know, again, if I was to ask many of you in this room that have children or grandchildren, if I asked you how often do you think about them, you'd say almost every hour. And you, I don't have to tell you to think about them. You automatically do. You know why? Because your heart belongs to them. The more that your heart belongs to Jesus, the more that you're going to naturally think about him throughout the day. And that's where prayer happens. 
We think about these set up prayer times and we should have those quiet times of prayer. But, but the prayer of unceasingness that Paul talks about, pray without ceasing, that's not sitting in a closet for 10 hours. That's thinking about God all day. And as he's putting people in your path, talking to God about it as you're talking to them. That's the Christian life. And David says, this is amazing. I'm awake and I'm still with you. All this time you've been thinking about me, but you've given me the ability to think about you. So how do I sum this up as we draw to a close? In one sentence, here it is. Christ's salvation of God's sacred work reveals that we are not trash to be recycled, but we're treasures to be restored. Say it again. Christ's salvation of God's sacred work reveals that we are not trash to be recycled, but treasures to be restored. Sometimes we can see the very worst of our sin, and we can begin to think this thought, maybe God made a mistake, or maybe God regrets that he made me altogether. Well, the scriptures would have something very different to say. It is true we are sinful, and it is true that we are broken. And we're born into that brokenness. If you need any example of that, go to a neonatal unit. All right, just anybody who deals with newborns, what's the sound that is the natural sound of coming into this world? Screaming. All right, if, they, if you don't hear screaming, then you should be worried because the natural reaction of being born into this world is the scream of a baby. That ought to tell you the type of world that we live in. However, God still did not make a mistake when he created this world. It's fallen, but everything he made, he made in goodness. Sin tainted that goodness. But Jesus Christ is going to blow the dust off. He's going to take everything that's broken and put it back together again. Our, we are hidden treasures and God is blowing the dust off. He's cleansing. He's changing. He's molding. And we are not what we're going to be. But the promise of what we're going to be ought to be able to change us here today. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All right, let me close out. <clears throat> I heard a pastor share this recently. I thought, that is, this is really helpful. I'm going to use this. All right? Adrian Rogers said, I milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. So I milk somebody else's cow, but I'm going to churn it here in about two minutes. The pastor said that in the span of eternity, we should be thinking about bad, good, better, and best. Bad is when you and I were born with a sinful nature. Now, we were made in the goodness and the, in, in the image of God, but we were sinful. Good is when we come to faith in Jesus because we receive the Holy Spirit and God begins that restoration project on the inside first, on the outside second. So we go from bad to good. Better is when you and I die if Jesus doesn't come back first and we ascend to the Father and we are in the, the temporary heaven, the present heaven that exists there today because we will be in spiritual glory. We'll never have a nature of sin again. But guess what the best is? The best is when Jesus Christ comes back and you will get a brand new body to match that brand new soul. Bad, good, better, best. So I ask as we close, where are you on the scale? If you're in this room and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to know that you're loved. You need to know that God created you with intention. God did not make a mistake on you, but God also enabled you to come from the, the genealogy of your ancestors, and through that you inherited a sinful nature, and the nature itself is bad. God is good, but our sin is bad. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you go from bad to good. Now he's at work. Now he's... He's restoring that treasure, your soul that he's given you. If you're in this room right now and, and uh, you're a Christian, you're in the good stage. I want to encourage you. Don't you be scared of what's better. Paul said, you know, 
I'm kind of torn here. I want to be here as long as possible to do ministry, but it, it's better by far to depart and be with the Lord. For those of you in this room that know that your days of being with him are a lot closer together than the days that you were here on the earth, don't you, don't you do anything but look at that with joy because you're going to go from good to better. You're going to have a nature where you'll never sin again, ever. And for those in heaven, they're in a state of better but right now they're looking towards the best. As great as the current heaven is now, I guarantee if you have a loved one who's there, they are anxiously awaiting for Jesus Christ to hear from the Father. All right, the last person has been saved. Son, go back and get your church. Because when that happens, we are going to go from better to best because you'll have a new body that will match the soul. Good, bad, better, best. As we draw to a close in searching God's sacred work, would you rest that you're not a mistake? Would you rest that there's no brokenness you have that cannot be repaired? Would you rest that you're not trash to be recycled, but that you are a treasure to be restored? Let's pray. Father, I, I just pray right now with all the brokenness in this room that we would trust you, that you did not make a mistake. There's nothing broken that will not be fixed in eternity. And there's nothing, even in the brokenness, that is meaningless here on earth. Everything, even in brokenness, there's meaning and purpose. That no one in this room is trash. Now, I don't care who we are, what we've done, what background we've come from, what we've been through. Lord, I just pray that we would see that we are of infinite value made in your image and also see other people that way, no matter how much we disagree with them. They are worthy of our love and our respect. And Lord, I just pray that we'd have great hope as we look forward, that the better and the best is yet to come. And that can give us the hope to live here in the good and also remember what you've done in the bad. So I just pray that you be with us right now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.